I think the foundation of your career should be something that you're generally passionate about and something that you're generally interested in because that will make your career sustainable. You know, no point pursuing something because you feel it's going to make you X amount and you've researched and the progression looks great, but then you're not passionate about it. If you're not passionate about it, you don't care about it much. You're not really going to necessarily have the drive to kind of do what it takes to excel or perform or worse. Um, if you, f- because it, if you're not passionate about something, it can really hinder your motivation to kind of like do the work and study. And then if that kind of leads to performance issues, that can really hit your self-esteem. But one of the bases I work with clients is just making sure that the roles in which that they're applying for, especially when we're talking about careers, long-term careers, is something that they're generally enthused by in industries that, you know, they um, have a respect for as well. Hello and welcome to episode six of Working to Work, a neurodivergent journey through employment. Um, I call it that, but this is not a podcast only for people who consider themselves neurodivergent. It's a podcast about different ways of thinking, behaving, learning and communicating, which nowadays might be considered uh, or termed neurodivergent, which can create barriers to fulfilling employment. And it aims to understand ways that individuals can authentically present their strengths and unique attributes in ways that might lead to more gratifying experiences with employment and thus their greater life, learning also from what has worked from some who um, exhibit similar characteristics. So I've been doing a fair bit of thinking in the last couple of months regarding the focus of this project. And if you want to read more about that, I've put some stuff up online on the webpage, which is www.kalou.co.uk forward slash w2w, the number two. Uh, So yeah, I've written up thoughts there, collected all the episodes together. um, So they're easily accessible. But I'll also say they are available on the podcast feed and on the YouTube channel. So if you want ease of access, please do subscribe and you'll be notified when new episodes come out. Um, I also want to hear what resonates and what doesn't and what you want to hear about. Um, That would really help the project, I think, as well as sharing. So yeah, all engagement is welcome and um, gratefully received. Back to this episode, it's a good one. They're all good ones in my mind, Um, but I just wanted to preface with that. I spoke with Stephanie Oswell, a careers advisor diagnosed with ADHD and the founder of the organization Cover My CV. Stephanie specializes in supporting neurodivergent individuals and those with underrepresented identities uh, gain employment and uh, make changes in their career. So um, very much aligned with the purposes and the uh, kind of objectives of this um project also kind of maintaining themselves within employment. And uh, yeah, we talked about a ton of things and Stephanie uh, shared advice that I think is really helpful on CV and cover letter um, composition, offering context, which I think from my own experience has been missing in the past. We spoke about aligning work with greater goals, using transferable skills instead of um, exact experience in order to demonstrate what you can do, Uh, the need for affirmation in work as a means to building confidence in one's strengths. And I also spoke with Stephanie about what impact one's neurodivergent traits might have on how they're perceived by others if they intersect with other marginalized identities such as race and gender, which I think is an important and interesting question. All in all, a very substantial and um, enjoyable conversation for me. I'm grateful that Stephanie could make the time. And um, yeah, I hope that you enjoy. Please do subscribe. Let me know what you think. Share any comments. And um, yeah, speak to you in the next episode. I'd like to ask guests if they um, are able to uh, introduce themselves and um, as I said in the intro you work as a career coach so an advisor 
And in your introduction, I wonder if you can speak to what that means for you and um, who you look to support and why. Thank you so much, Sham, firstly, for inviting me on the podcast. Um, I've really been looking forward to do this. Um, I classify myself as a, a careers advisor, so I'm a qualified careers advisor. And I basically provide um, impartial careers guidance, um, support and resources to job seekers at all levels. I am the founder of Cover My CV, which is an independent career development agency, which I started in 2014. And since then, I've supported hundreds, if not like thousands of applicants through webinars, one-to-one support, um, workshops, training, facilitation, basically to help them um, achieve their um, career goals. I also work with, I also work on a B2B kind of basis, so with academic institutions, charities, corporate organizations to provide, you know, training um, as well. So yeah, that's kind of me in a nutshell. I'm, I'm curious to like dig into your strengths in general, but I wonder, like you said, you started this in 2014. What was it that you kind of recognized in yourself that you thought, I'll be, I'll be good at this, or this is something that I'm passionate about? Um, when I was younger, I'm like talking about college um, and in this context, UK college was about 16 to about 19. Um, I remember I wanted to work at like Topshop, you know. We had basically a, a friend that um, knew my family at the time and they were like, yeah, I can get you a job. Just bring up your CV. I remember just like printing off templates and just kind of go my way. And like, I just had like a rack of like papers and just pouring my heart out and just just talking rubbish like really selling myself and I'll never forget it like the manager looked at me looked at the CV looked at who was meant to be my plug like to get me the role and I didn't get it kind of lit a fire up in me because I'm I'm someone where I do tend to see failure as an opportunity it's like oh I didn't get this and I wanted it why didn't I get that and I see that as if I didn't get it that means Mm, I need to put myself in the best position. So I just spent so much time researching CVs, cover letter templates, all of that, all of that, all of that. And after that, I've, I've always basically gotten interviews for jobs I've applied for. So it started off with me doing cover letters and CVs for like friends and family. And then I started going on Twitter. And that, back then I used to charge like 20 pounds for like a cover letter, okay? And I started doing it from like my Twitter followers. So it was very much like, you know, um, referral based and it wasn't, I didn't set up a business or anything until I, I went to the University of Leicester and they have an amazing, um, they have amazing support for students who want to be entrepreneurs or considering self-employment. So there were a few programs that they were doing and, um, like competitions and stuff. And I basically kind of got, um, 500 pounds from a grant funder and that helped me kind of um, it wasn't much, but at the time it was much because the nature of my business, I didn't necessarily need, it wasn't like I was building products or, you know, rolling out something big. I used the money to, uh, pay for a web designer and stuff like that and get kind of like my operations set up. And yeah, that was kind of like the birth of my agency. And since then I kind of won funding from O2 Telephotonica. They had like a think big scheme where they basically give you um, access to like venues and support and mentorship and stuff like that to fund your projects. So I off cover my CV, I kind of launched cover my skills because I noticed that I could do the CVs and stuff like that. But then I noticed that young people weren't really getting the support they needed to just cope with adulthood generally. So I run like money, money advice workshops where we actually got, um, professionals from, um, the treasury to come, um, and the money advice service. So that was huge. And also um, lecturers from Open University. I, I really love collaborating um, with partner organizations to kind of feed into any agenda or like mission that I'm working towards. And it was really fulfilling. Just like speaking to the, the CV, I wonder like when you're going for that top shop job and you, you, re- you wrote this CV and you didn't get that job, what is it that you learned like from um, doing the research subsequent to that, that you reflect and say, okay, this is why maybe that CV wasn't effective that like helped you gain that, that kind of confidence in your ability to write CVs that get you opportunities and to support others. Like, 
I, I'll just give you a bit of context from, from my own experience. I feel like it was only in my only early 30s that I realized a cover letter really needs to be taking the things that are in your CV and speaking to why they align with like um, the responsibilities that you for the job that you're applying for i never clocked that or i don't remember being kind of taught that so i was kind of freestyling it and they always felt like i'm not sure this is what they want or what they're looking for and so what you offer i think would have been incredibly helpful of like this is the purpose of this um cover letter this is the reason they asked for that yeah i think i think um and i think this is especially for entry level um applicants is if you're especially if you study something like social sciences humanities you're very used to writing like prose like very very like verbose and you know explaining and justifying i think the main thing is if you kind of see it as like a statement of what you've done and the impact that you've made as concisely as you can, number one, um, you also need to make sure that it's tailored to the industry that um, you're kind of focusing on. And also you need to kind of make sure that it includes like standard information. So, you know, where you studied, the grades that you've gotten, um, you know, your level of like qualification. So that's kind of what should be on like your CV. Um, and when it comes to your cover letter, so what I tend to find, and this is literally like something that I went over with a client yesterday is your cover letter can't just be, uh, what, what tends to happen? People reg regurgitate like their CV onto their cover letter. So it's literally like, <laughs> as if they just wrote longer sentences of their CV when actually this is a time for you to really use examples, specific examples, usually about three, um, of where you've performed and delivered on those responsibilities. Something that I tend to notice um, with applicants, especially if they tend to use like templates, notice that is um they won't write anything about the company which is crazy right because you know you're you're applying for a specific company and you've done no you've not done the thing is you could have done research but if you're not showing them that you've done that research you, you need to tell the employer you need to tell you need to let the company know you know why you want to work for them so when you even just do research on you know their ethos and their values maybe going a step further any white papers or awards or their clientele or what markets they operate in all those things can make such a huge difference especially if they can tell that you've not just kind of copied and pasted it off the home page um so those are kind of my recommendations on like cv tips but yeah i think by working on myself that's the thing. I'm the type of person, like, I work on myself, I get results for myself, and then I kind of move into others. So it started off with CV writing and cover letter writing and then offering that as services and then progressing into getting a qualification in career development and management so I can get more into the coaching element. So um, lately my business has kind of, kind of gone from the whole, not gone because I still do it, it's my expertise but it's shifting more towards um more of like the coaching and the development because i really have a knack for nurturing people seeing people go from here to here i've had clients um from diverse backgrounds who are very anxious very unsure of themselves having imposter syndromes to um really kind of like excelling in their careers in getting coveted positions and I always make sure that the support and the guidance and the resources that I offer are tailored to them. I think about situations where there's people that might be really um really great for a job, have the skill to do it, have the the kind of um the desire, but maybe haven't been given the opportunity to get into a situation where they can give an example of like a challenging situation uh, that they've then uh, dealt with and what the kind of outcome has been in the kind of star method. I wonder if there's like, what would you offer someone that maybe doesn't can't think of an example uh, that they could offer in, in an interview situation or on, on a, a cover letter, um, but believes that they can do it and just need that opportunity to demonstrate that? Yeah, so um, I would start off by saying, 
um, sometimes people do actually have examples, but they may not actually consider it worthy of that. So um, let's say um, what I tend to find is clients may not have experience in that industry. So they're like, oh my God, like, I don't know when. So what I tend to focus on is drawing on examples where they can showcase the transferable skills and the transferable experience. So you may not have done it for this uh, role and in this industry, but where have you showcased this elsewhere? Um, and and that can even include um, even it, during education. So um, for example, if if the question is asking about teamwork, um, and maybe you haven't necessarily led on something in your work experience, um, we can point to examples where you've worked effectively as part of a team on a specific module, on a final year project. Um, do you know what I mean? Like at university or on your apprenticeship or something like that. So drawing from where it is relevant. So I tend to like look at like their education to see if there are any kind of projects that they've done. Also, um, extracurricular people do a really amazing things um, outside of work. They coach, they volunteer, they mentor, they do all of this, um, but they don't necessarily regard that as proper experience because they haven't been paid for it. Another thing I do as well um, is sometimes I will I will challenge them and say, you know, is this actually the right role for you? Um, you know, I don't believe in setting my clients up to fail if if they're aiming for a what role where I'm like mm, sometimes I say okay happy for you to go ahead with this but maybe what we can do is create you an effective job set strategy where we're targeting roles where you can actually build that experience because when you get that experience you will also build that confidence and you'll be able to talk about it confidently do you see what I mean so sometimes there's certain clients where you just have to not kind of take them back a bit, but just realign them to position themselves for roles where they might actually be more um, suited for as well um, as like a last ditch option. Yeah, hundred percent. And and from my again from my own experience, like sometimes I feel one needs a job. You're looking at something maybe fits into what you can do, and you go for it, but you're not hundred percent sure that is actually what you want to do. And I think from that's when I found that I haven't put in that work necessarily to understand the company, to prove to them, like to demonstrate like why I want to work there. And I think um really kind of what well, well, I would be advising someone I'm not in your position but if I was advising myself or in a position to do so I would be asking do you want to do this job because if I think someone is really motivated to do the job they're probably going to be motivated to do that research and then like, demonstrate that I imagine um, so I wonder if there's an aspect to that of kind of like beyond do you have the necessarily the capability or are you do you have the skills yet to do it like do you want to do it do you find that there are people that are kind of applying for jobs because it's a job as opposed to um a sense of like this is really what they want to do yeah so i do have clients come up to me like oh um what oh what should i do or um what do you think i should do or oh i've heard this is cool and pays well um so yeah it's about ascertaining motivations passion um, especially if you're considering like retraining or investing in a qualification. I try to get my clients in a position where they feel that they have careers as opposed to jobs. Obviously, if you're just coming to me and you want like a temp job somewhere, that's fine. Let's say you're in between or you have, let's say, care and responsibilities and you just need something to kind of like supplement your income. But most of my clients, it's about helping them to build careers. Um, and that I think is the number one challenge that I'm finding with certain individuals where they feel like they have jobs and not necessarily careers. So I'm working with them to build careers. And I always say to someone, um, I think the foundation of your career should be something that you're generally passionate about and something that you're generally interested in because that will make your career sustainable. You know, no point pursuing something because you feel it's going to make you X amount and you've researched and the progression looks great, but then you're not passionate about it. If you're not passionate about it, you don't care about it much. You're not really going to necessarily have the drive to kind of do what it takes to excel or perform or worse. Um, if you, because it, if you're not passionate about something, it can really hinder your motivation to kind of like do the work and study. And then 
if that kind of leads to performance issues, that can really hit your self-esteem. So I think one of the bases I work with clients is just making sure that the roles in which that they're applying for, especially when we're talking about careers, long-term careers, is something that they're generally enthused by in industries that, you know, they um, have a respect for as well. Yeah, 100% makes sense. I, I want to um, speak to the the work you do with neurodivergent status individuals, but just before we get onto that, I'm curious, um, when you said when you're working with mid-career to, I can't remember what you how defined it, Mid to senior, what do you find that they need um, in terms of support? Because as you say, they've potentially got the experience. Um, what are they after from you? Let me first define that. So we're talking probably about like five years post uni or um, qualification. So they've built quite a few years in industry. Um, they've got experience under their belt. And then senior ones that like they've started to get like management positions and they're kind of moving up like um, the ladder. Um, I do also work with entrepreneurs, but in this case, I am talking about people who kind of have the standard kind of nine to five. So um, what I tend to find is so there are there's a cohort where what tends to happen is they didn't really receive much careers guidance or good enough careers <laughs> guidance, and they've just managed to fall into something. As in, my dad did this, so I'm doing this. Um, I just applied for something. I got into it, and I've kind of worked my way up. And then they get to about, what, 32, 28, 40. And they realize that they don't like the industry they're in. They don't feel challenged by the world. So usually it's those professionals that say, I want a change. That's what they come to me with. So helping career changes go from one industry to something that they're actually passionate about. So I have a program called Career Transition Mastery where I basically help you get from A to B, so from one industry to the next. So th that's one segment. Um, and I think another kind of big thing is really lacking confidence in their skills, not knowing what their skills are. Um, and there's varying reasons for this first of all there are so many prof uh, professionals neurotypical neurodivergent alike that aren't affirmed in their jobs aren't affirmed in their roles and when you're not being affirmed um verb verbally or otherwise um you're not getting that recognition for what you do so you're not really seeing yourself for who you are i can see though objectively because i'm a careers advisor so I see many people like you and I can see that you're doing fantastically on paper, but they don't feel that. They don't feel good enough. So I tend to work with um, professionals, mid to senior professionals, more in that confidence building. And that really is at the heart of the programs and services that I offer because you may come to me and um, you may want like a pay increase, uh, progression, or you want to move different, in uh, move to another industry. But in order for you to do that, it really helps if you believe in your skills and your abilities, because that will allow you to convey that at interview passionately and confidently, right? So you can basically convince like the interviewer and the employer to get you, you know, the role of what you want. So I would say people want to change careers and people who kind of need um, help developing their skills and like their confidence. So that's really, really fascinating, both of those answers. Just to pick you up on the first one, I'm curious, like as someone who's been in a position where they've been, they kind of fell into work, like audio production work, it wasn't necessarily what I just, you know, thought I would, I would do, but you fall into it and you work for it for a while. And then I realized like this, as I was going, isn't right, isn't fulfilling me. As you mentioned, I don't feel challenged and I'm not, I'm finding it difficult to find my way. Um, I wonder like what you, in your experience, you find like precipitates that change, that desire to like shift gears and pivot um, for the people you're saying kind of a mid to senior uh, career and, and kind of the age range that you mentioned. I think the number one statement I hear is, I'm not feeling challenged enough. And when professionals don't feel challenged, they don't feel motivated as well. Um, this is especially the case for professionals who want to feel like they're making an impact. Um, so that's uh, one thing that I found um, I think as well, it's also coming to that place of 
right what am I doing with my life you know because it's like I've probably got at least 20 30 more years work, um, left and it's like crap if I don't leave now I'm I feel stuck so I tend to find um people who have been in professions for a really long time and they're kind of like anxious that they don't have marketable skills to take them elsewhere or they've been in a specific organization. I know people have been in literally the same organization for like 10, 15, 20 years and they feel stagnant. So that's kind of like the biggest thing that I feel with career changes. I think that's a really interesting point, the one you made about um, people feeling they're making a difference. I think to add to like me feeling like I wasn't being challenged, I wasn't able to maybe get opportunities that were, were really challenging me or you kind of you get you reach a ceiling but making a difference i think for certain people and i would argue and i don't know because you don't speak to every single person but i believe that that is of maybe not greater significance but neurodivergent people i think on, on the whole like the, those that i meet have a desire i think to kind of do impactful work um, and to kind of believe in the kind of mission of a of a company and from my experience that's where a challenge sometimes can lie like when you're kind of like sold an idea of how something is and why they're doing it and it's kind of does, doesn't seem to align with reality and, and that can be uh, challenging um, and then just the other point you made about um, the second group that where they're not being affirmed I wonder like what why you think that is like what could change in a way that it's great that there are the coaches like you that recognize that and can support but how might people be better supported in employment um, so they do feel that confidence in their strengths yeah first of all the concept of appraisals sh it shouldn't flicker in your mind like crap am I getting fired or damn like it should be a process where um people are being you know affirmed and rewarded for the good work that they've done but also it can be something really small like a piece of work is handed handed in and people are saying you know oh that was that's amazing like that's fantastic oh this is a re you've worked really hard on this or oh, i really appreciate this i understand that middle managers are often like management can be like very solutions or results focused and um but there needs i think organizations should implement processes to you know highlight employees and teams of people who have done exceptional work um i've been at companies where every kind of week you know when you kind of have a town hall um you have the opportunity to congratulate like a fellow member of staff on whether they've supported you and helped you I think that's really good as opposed to this is our employee of the month the rest of you are crap kind of thing <laughs> um actually having employees kind of sit down and say you know either virtually or you know in the office and say you know what thank you so much Susan for helping me with that I really appreciate you know that can really even help with uh, camaraderie when it then comes on more of a management level um so just fostering a culture where um you are kind of affirming your members of staff and you are kind of um, allowing people to, and I'm recording, you know, um, the progress that they have made. Another thing is beyond, because usually the awards and the recognition comes by way of performance. So, wow, you did X amount of sales and you improved that. But actually what is really good is, you know, you really helped support me on this project. Um, you you were pivotal in this team. You picked up the slap for this person. It's almost like um, personal qualities as well. People need to be affirmed on that. It's not just performance or productivity, but people who are helping hands. Like and that it that comes from when you've made an environment inclusive, and you generally make people feel part of a team. So you mentioned like the majority of your work or like one of your key focuses at the moment is working with um, neurodivergent status individuals. Um, I wonder why did you decide to make that your focus or is that an organic thing? And I think as a context, I've always worked with underrepresented groups, um, either by race or disability um, or their, their care leavers. So that since 2014 has always kind of been my focus because it's giving support to those who generally fall through the cracks like if you look at like the attainment rates of for example like 
black students at university. You see, you went to university, you didn't really get the support. There was no outreach. Now you got a tutu. Um, automatically, that can kind of put you at a disadvantage or you feel like it does or your confidence has been hit. With those who are neurodivergent, so when I was diagnosed with ADHD, I think what was such a healing experience for me was my master's program. So I did a master's in career development and management. Um, so I learned about, you know, all the theories and everything. So when it was time to do our dissertation, I wanted to focus it on adults with ADHD. So how ADHD manifests in the workplace. And I think from then I said, wow, like, hearing statistics like most likely to be under and unemployed. Um, I think I read somewhere like people with autism experience like unemployment, underemployment at 78%, um, which is crazy if you compare that to the national average. Um, just kind of reading up on certain statistics of attainment levels to um, educational outcomes, which obviously impact on long-term kind of like life outcomes in general, you know, um, that really made me say, wow, there's a lot of work here to be done. And I've kind of taken it upon myself because people who have neurodivergent conditions don't tend to be treated by people with neurodivergent conditions. And I, whilst I don't necessarily believe, oh, your GP has to have ADHD if you have ADHD, that's not what I'm saying. But there are some professions I feel that that lived experience really makes all the difference. Not doesn't theoretically, but also by way of a compassion where someone can actually say, you actually get it. So yeah, I've really enjoyed the process of helping this. I've I um I ran a session for ADHD babes, and that and I the feedback was like, oh my god, that's like the best like session that I've ever received in my life. That was amazing. I never, and it's very easy to feel like oh fantastic, but actually it's like yikes, that's not good. You're like twenty nine years old. And this is the first time that you've gotten, you felt like this off the back of me, just putting together a one hour workshop. That shouldn't be the case. Um, so yeah, I've, I've really, it's a beautiful thing because they're learning from me, but I'm also learning from them as well. You know, people who are neurodivergent, we are not all of the same. Um, I've met people with ADHD who are who who have literally climbed to the top of project management careers, who ace admin. Like, oh, we're or not we're disorganized. We're this. Not not all of us. Some of us hyper focus on that, and we are the most organized people that you will ever meet in your entire life. Um, and then you have some people where they're struggling to find a clean shirt every morning. You know, so it really does depend. But I think my focus is. And this is an ethos that I carry, whether or not I work with people who consider themselves ND, neurodivergent or not, is to make sure that I'm delivering interventions and services that are tailored. What was the, main, the core focus of that ADHD in the workplace? Was it what is um, a barrier for people who have ADHD um, and in, in employment? Or was it kind of the experience of people with ADHD in employment or a combination? Yeah, so it's basically about like um, how it how ADHD man adult ADHD manifests in the workplace, how um, careers advisors can support people with ADHD, and just kind of like highlighting some trends. So, for example, in my research, um, it's like wow, people with ADHD tend to be entrepreneurs. Like um, we tend to be overrepresented in um, kind of that space. But then also analyzing that and being like, does that mean that, wow, like AD people with ADHD reject the system and we just want to be entrepreneurs? No, nope. 
actually a lot of the time um, when the standard office or workplace doesn't accommodate your needs and isn't structured or organized in the ways that you can thrive, people go their own way because they're forced to, you know? Um, so yeah, that, that was the, the, a uh, finding. Um, so tending to work in work, tending to be overrepresented, overrepresented in entrepreneurship due to, so for example, um, you know, like people with ADHD, they tend to, people with ADHD tend to be really, 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 really good at something. And what I've noticed, and I'll speak for myself at this, I won't generalize. Um, if you're working in an environment, if you're working in a job, they, a lot of the time, like they expect you to be good at everything. Like every single part of the world you have to be a hundred percent good in. If you're 70% good in this, but it's like, nah. Whereas if you own your own company, you can literally just laser focus on what you're really good at and delegate what you're not so good at. Do you see what I mean? That's making you successful in that venture. Um, also, just thinking about how people with um, ADHD kind of like struggle in typical work environments, um, not necessarily having their needs and accommodations met. Um, in preparation for this interview, I listened to a few interviews you've done before, and what you just said reminded me of a point you made, I think, in the um, was it Harvard Business Review, um, one of the previous interviews you've done, um, talking about a, a kind of a barrier to getting to positions where like, you can really thrive because the alliance of your strengths can be that um, your the, 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 the jobs that you have prior to that don't lend to your strengths and because you're not one isn't necessarily able to do them to, to the degree desired or by other psych type admin type roles you're it's kind of perceived as well they're not kind of good at this or they're not kind of paying attention or dedicated but really it's actually that, that kind of admin i think you were giving an example of your own experience um and and that kind of being a barrier in a way to getting into the, actually the kind of maybe more like um, systems thinking organizational role that does kind of work better with your mind than um, than and uh, it, as you say it differs from person to person. Some people might be like really great at, at doing kind of um, that type of work, um, but it's an interesting one. Like the thought of um, how do you get to the place where, that you want to be and you can really demonstrate your skills. Um, if like to get there, you've got to get through jobs that really don't, you can't, aren't particularly good at and can't delegate because you're not in a position yet to do that. Yeah. So at the moment, um, I'm trying. So if any listeners are kind of tuning in, I'm looking to partner with organizations who are willing to take on uh, people who are neurodivergent um, in positions or even if just insight days or brainstorming days or internships, basically opportunities where they can show their value at kind of a strategic high level because um, I'm following on from what you've said, Sam. In typical Western working culture, you, you, you're meant to cut your teeth, right? You know, filing papers, uh, making tea and you the idea is you do the grunt mean your work and you work your way up the ranks and then you can get into strategy and partnership and sales and ma all of that right whilst i understand the logic of that right what tends to happen is people with adhd especially so i have an attentive type we can really struggle with the admin based stuff that tends to get lumped at entry level um I give you a classic example. So um, I used to work for a multinational IT company and I was kind of really struggling with that work. So because I was struggling with that work, um, they didn't put me on to like the sales program, which is basically where you learn to be a salesman and basically like, and it was so, looking back on it, that was so disheartening for me because because I wasn't doing well in, in an area that my brain literally made things really struggle for me, the opportunity where I would have really excelled, and I'm a fantastic salesman, I can sell 
anything to anyone. I didn't get put for something where I would have actually done really well. So it meant that other graduates were given that position and that opportunity, but I wasn't. But imagine if I was given that opportunity, I could have showed why I really excelled and really shined. What do you think a solution to that is? Like, how, how would you, what would you offer to change that paradigm so that you can get to that position where you can demonstrate what you're really good at? Yeah, I think um, when working with um, clients who are ND um, and you know they're ND, right? Because you can't action what you don't know. Um, but I think giving people opportunities to showcase their strengths um, and allowing people to do the things that they're good at. Sometimes I think it's really ridiculous where it's like, this is the organizational structure. We've hired you to do this. Why don't you allow people to do the things that they do best in, right? That will more likely like improve the operations of your business. And then just, do you understand? Like do things accordingly. Like you may have someone on your team who you've noticed that they really shine in like more of a sales client facing capacity, but they're kind of lumped in project work. That's why I think it's really important for teams, especially resource um, teams where they have like learning and development kind of offices to continuously kind of review the skills of their candidates and what people are good at and like change the structures accordingly because you can really miss out on you know talent and where people are thriving so we talked about some of the challenges of neurodivergent individuals what challenges that do you find um if you can speak to any that are unique to people with kind of a combination of kind of what we might consider marginalized identity so for example like a black woman with um, adhd um, how might that kind of manifest in terms of challenges in the workplace and and how their traits are potentially received and whether that's impacted by their other identities quite a complex question but I, I hope you understand yeah no no I get that question completely so I work very closely with an organization called um, ADHD babes so we are planning to run career development workshops and programs specifically for this cohort so ADHD babes they have ADHD either formally diagnosed or they have kind of like self-diagnosis they have adhd and they're black as well um they tend to be f mostly us uk but we also have like members you know from like within africa the caribbean etc etc so you have that thing of gender and race and disability so we've got three for three there right um so what tends to happen is, right, I may have crippling anxiety because I'm just using this example. I may have crippling anxiety because I've been fired out of seven of my four jobs due to my ADHD. And I'm an introverted person, but you're taking that anxiety as she's stuck up um, or you know, she's not a team player. Sometimes you can be in organizations where there's a feeling like you should be, you should be, you should feel grateful to be there. And good old racism, um, what tends to happen a lot of the time is, because we live in a capitalist system, capitalism as an economic and social system at its core, and honestly, I'm saying this, it doesn't actually matter where you lie on the po political sphere. I don't tend to get into that with my clients or professionally. It's not something that I necessarily, but this system, it, it, it produces like, it, what, what, competition, right? Competition, isn't that the whole thing? Laissez-faire, all that, right? Competition can also breed insecurity. And security can also breed envy, right? And if we add layers of race to that, there are people who see, for example, black women thriving in the workplace and feel threatened, right? And not even to blame the individual, but we, we live in a system where it's like crap. Oh, she's doing 
good as me. She might take my job. Like, do you know what I mean? Or she may get promoted over me and and made worse by the fact that people aren't generally in very affirming um, kind of environments. So what tends to happen is you find, for example, black women with ADHD, they don't even know whether it's the racism, whether it's the ageism, whether it's the, a lot of the time it's all of those things. Misogynoir is very, very real. Um, and having a female manager doesn't cut it. Like that's not the be and end all. Um, I've heard some horror stories. So I think the point I'm trying to make is when you have multiple um, identities, um, so gender, race, also class as well, what tends to happen is due to people's personal biases, unconscious biases as they call them, um, they tend, they leak, they leak out. There's something called the pet to threat phenomenon. I don't know if you've heard of it where black women come to workforces, usually workforces, uh, company environments that aren't really diverse. They get a diverse employee, so let's say a black person, um, and it starts off well. So it's like, ah, and I feel like if you are neurodivergent, it's very easy for you to fall into the pet to threat phenomenon because... Oh, you, oh, you've got a disability, do you? Okay, great. We're going to give you all these accommodations, all this work. Da, 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 da. Um, and then what tends to happen is like once that person starts excelling or doing well, you then turn from pet to threat. Okay, so when you're doing well and you have all these ideas and people start to like you a lot more and you're excelling and maybe that person, maybe your manager's manager has really got their eye on you and say, oh, you're you know, and then the bullying and the discrimination starts and the being iced out, it's awful. The amount of black women I know, neurotypical, uh, neurodivergent otherwise, who are be who have had who have been forced out of their professions and their industries due to, you know, discrimination, workplace bullying is horrific. Not just men, uh, not just women, men too. It's absolutely horrific. I also have found the trend of younger employees doing extremely well, getting, uh, uh, making their managers, I feel threatened and getting pushed out of the organization. I've seen it happen to um, a former partner of mine. It's happened to multiple of my clients. And I feel like when you're neurodivergent, what can also happen is you might not even come into an environment that is supportive and accommodating of your needs. I actually feel like that's not so much of a company issue. It is a company issue, but I feel like the government needs to be more proactive in like the policies and the directives and also the support and funding that they that they should actually be given to support and guidance that they should be given to support um, companies. I feel like that needs to be something that actually comes from like the very, very top, and then that will kind of like trickle down. Um, and I also feel like um, when we think about things like, yes, the Disability Act, the, that a lot of the time it's, you know, okay, like the bare minimum legal requirements. But beyond that, what we want to do is we want to create environments where people can thrive, right? So let's forget about, okay, like how can I actually thrive? in this workplace because the average person with ADHD doesn't want to sue you doesn't want to go to tribunal they just want a job and feed their family and have a good time and have money to go on holidays and all that kind of stuff I just want to live okay so before acts and unions all that we like how can we make these organizations tenable how can we make them truly supportive and inclusive um I think, and I'm sure you have, we're seeing a lot of neurodiversity hiring programs. And I think it's just, I, I'm trying to be as professional as possible, but just a lot of companies jerking themselves off over how inclusive, what they've basically done is they've probably got like an intern to produce a white paper about how inclusive they are. And then they're using it to basically market themselves. Like I'm not, I personally, I'm not buying it. There's a couple of things, actually, just to say, um, in terms of the government, the first episode of Work to Work was with Robert Buckland, who's the MP leading this review into the shockingly low autistic employment rate. But that's meant to cover kind of all neurodivergent conditions. So they're, they're actually meant to be publishing a, a paper that does have suggestions and hopefully policies, as you say, or aspects that will kind of 
infiltrate like the system and the other thing about who gives that award episode three this is not me trying to plug just that they're relevant i think to um what we're talking about i spoke to the um, ceo of autistica who have come up with this um neuro um neurodiversity employment index which is exactly trying to do that basically like companies and this is this is an organization that like is fundamentally invested in um disability rights um uh, so it'd be interesting like then there would be someone that really does care and and, uh, and would has metrics that they've developed to, to hopefully be able to validate whether an employer is living up to not just living up to like, what they say but offer support to support organizations to do that not just kind of like brandish them it's good bad or good um but yeah, but that's not not there yet, and I don't know, as you say, who validates these kind of like awards uh, that you you mention. Yeah, there are too many neurodivergent employees and professionals experiencing the most horrific bullying, discrimination under employees who have that disability confident badge, who have won awards, who have all of this. So, with being on the side of those clients coming to me for respite, it's made me be like, ah. Yeah, so we're coming to the end. It's been a really fascinating conversation. I'm curious, like, what, in terms of your own career, um, are you excited about in terms of the future? And then also, like, what are your hopes for the future of employment? We've spoken about a lot, but I wonder if there's kind of one thing. So myself and Ayana Gibbs, we are writing, in terms of, like, co-authorship, the first ever published book with an actual publisher on um, ADHD. So we're writing a book on how ADHD affects black women, self-help style. Um, and for me, this is my legacy. Um, it's going to be a love letter to black women with ADHD like me. And it's, it, it's a, a serious landmark in my career. Does it have a name, a title yet, the book? title working title is um the palette within understanding adhd in black women um so the palette within like understanding like you know the colors like the nuances you know of what it means to be a black woman with adhd this is going to be a pivotal piece of literature because it's actually like furthering the conversation on like disability and neurodivergence because by covering the unique experiences of people with ADHD who, you know, intersecting factors of like race, class, gender, it will, I think it will really push like disability advocacy and research forward. I always say when you support the most marginalized and underrepresented, you support everyone as a result, right? When you meet the needs of those who are considered and the bottom or like disregarded you automatically support um everyone else um and then following on from that um i'm also excited about piloting and you know developing a few more career development programs so i am trying to get funding for in-person career development programs specifically aimed at neurodivergent individuals so if you're listening and you're out there, you want to sponsor someone, me, please hit me up. I love it. And I loved all the joy when you talk about all these things that you're doing, which I think speaks to like what you're speaking about, what others you want others to have, like a sense of like excitement and like desire for the thing they're looking to do. Uh, last quick question. I want to get more into facilitating work. What if, there was, if there's one thing you could offer me in terms of advice? What would it be for doing that type of work especially maybe if you're coming from a place of like be, being a bit more introverted like a bit nervous sometimes in like group situations what could you what would you what would you suggest to me but has a desire to do it yeah so i would say um partner with the right people find someone who is already doing what they're what you want to do shadow work alongside them learn the ins and out because when it comes to workshop facilitation if you're introverted maybe you're not necessarily the person in the beginning facilitating you could be the one pitching to organizations winning business creating the workshop schedules brainstorming strategizing and then you kind of partner with someone to deliver that um i would also say 
um, find out what your specialism is. So uh, when we talk about workshop facilitation, that's huge. Who do we want to target? What do we want to do? What are the outcomes? Um, what, what do you want your impact to be? And you start there and you almost kind of reverse engineer and work your, work your way backward. But once you kind of have that North Star, that vision of what you want to do, it's about finding the right people to do it with. Um, a piece of advice I'll give to you and everyone else is if you are neurodivergent, a lot of the time when you want to start new projects, you're so excited. It becomes a shiny new object. You want to go all guns blazing. What I would say is always make sure that anything that you do and commit to, you do it sustainably. So you make sure that you have the right systems, tools, operations, the right people in place to make sure that it is a success as much as it can be. Because I think the worst thing you can do is something that was once excitement turns to a source of shame and failure because your symptoms impact you know, that delivering the outcome and that is a huge shame. Um, you mean, it's different if it's a job you don't really care about, but when it's something that you're passionate about and then it all starts falling apart because you've not managed your symptoms appropriately, that really hurts deeply. And I know that from experience. So um, finding the right people to do things with, learning from them. Sometimes you don't need to start your own thing. Sometimes you can collaborate with people who already have things going and then ease yourself into it. So... Is that good quiz advice, Sam? <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Now I've got a taste of, well, first of all, great advice for me in general, but a bit of a taster of, um, yeah, what it's like working with you, I guess. Um, thank you so much, Stephanie. Last thing, um, where can people find you if they're interested in getting in touch with all the, the various things that you're doing? Yes. So find me on LinkedIn. Um, Stephanie Ozwo, I'll come up. Um, Stephanie O-Z-U-O. On my Instagram, cover my CV UK. You can follow me on Instagram and follow my company page. You can drop me a message there. And you can drop me an email. You can drop me an email, my personal email, stephanieozo at gmail.com. And then in the subject, you can just reference this podcast and I'll know that you're inquiring from there. Um, at the moment, I am seeking sponsors and um, organizations wishing to basically complement this journey that I'm on to make workplaces in the UK uh, more inclusive. I think my my dream, my absolute dream would be to run like almost like an internship program, but for mid to senior level um, professionals who have ADHD and autism, but instead of like making tea or doing menial stuff, like, you know, transforming strategy, helping with digital transformation, coming up with amazing ideas and then hopefully getting them at the job at the end. Because I feel like um, so many people who are neurodivergent, they just need the opportunity to shine. So what I'm doing at the moment is I'm actually helping with my career development programs. I'm helping on one side, like getting people confident, helping them with their skills, training them up but it all really depends on these employers giving them the chance and the opportunity i can't control that so at the moment i'm looking for organizations to put their money their resources their time and their devotion where their mouth is to help that come into fruition so yeah that's kind of like my goals moving forward in the new year and great goals and great thank mission you. um thank you so much thank you Stephanie. right thank you